evening, Tuckahoe. Uh, welcome to the uh, Wednesday, April 8th um, Zoning Board of Appeals for the Village of Tuckahoe. Uh, can we do the roll call? Member Ringwald. Here. Member Palladino. Present. Member Barrende. Present. Chairman Scalzo. Present. And uh, the, the real chairman, Ron Gallo, had an emergency, so he's unable to uh, be here tonight. Um, we wish him the best. I, I know he'll be... Uh, He'll be back uh, next month for sure. Um, before we start, let's uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great. And before we start with our... Uh, with our items on the agenda, let's first uh, uh, approve the uh, minutes from the last meeting. So um, I make a motion to approve the, uh, the minutes from the last uh, Zoning Board of Appeals meeting on March 11th. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so we've got uh, several things on the agenda. Uh, the first one that we're going to call up is at 100 Main Street. Um, we are going to continue the public hearing on that. And uh, we'll allow um, the applicant to speak um, in one second here. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge two, th two letters that we received on 100 Main Street uh, property, the old Salerno's property, for those of you who have been around a while. One is a uh, letter from uh, Kevin uh, Wernos of um, uh, 12 Henry Street um, that was uh, sent to the Board of Trustees, which was then forwarded to us. Uh, he's concerned. Um, uh, that any development there we need to take into account the impact on um, on parking the impact on, uh, on on traffic and congestion as well as um, um, impact on the school system and of course we do consider all of those whenever making a uh, decision um, so we'll enter that into the record Nancy has a copy of that and that will be available for anyone to see the um, second letter that I'd actually like to read is uh, dated March 11th and is from um, Antonio Leo, the chairman of the planning board. Um, and this is addressed to Chairman Gallo. Uh, Dear Chairman Gallo, I've reviewed the February zoning board meeting where the applicant represented to your board that the planning board was in favor of the proposed design of the project at 100 Main Street, Tuckahoe, New York. I would like to clarify my position and the position of the members of the planning board. Our position is that we would clearly like to see a development of the project at 100 Main Street. However, we would be opposed to a project that would include a fourth floor. I understand that a fourth floor is not in the purview of the planning board, but I felt it necessary to respond to the representations of the applicant at the last meeting with respect to my board's position. Further, we would prefer that the retail remain on the first floor of the project so as not to have a parking garage front Main Street as it would be out of character of the neighborhood. I hope that this letter clarifies the position of the undersigned and certain members of the planning board. Very truly yours, Antonio Leo, chairman of the planning board. So those two letters are now in the, um, in the public record, and I'd like to uh, invite the applicant up to uh, discuss um, 100 Main Street. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, members of the board, I'm acting, Mr. Chairman. The uh, Les Marin, Marin and Mazzanti, uh, for the applicant, MC Equities LLC, who's the owner of the property at 100 Main Street. It is section 28, block 5, lots 3, 5, and 7. Um, I will, we were only given a copy of, and I do appreciate the courtesy of, of receiving Mr. Leo's letter at least earlier this evening, though it is dated March 11th, which was the last date of your, last time you folks met. And I will address that a little later. I want to get on to some other items quickly, and I'll keep, keep it as brief as possible. Uh, we were first before this board in October of 2014. We met at a work session. Uh, we were asked to review some items, uh, possibly juggle around and change some items. We did that. We came back uh, in November. Uh, again, there was some concern, so we adjourned it to December. We appeared at public hearings on December 10th, 2014. We were asked to hold off in January. We came back on February 4th, 2015, on March 11th, 2015. Um, at, at that meeting, there were some suggested changes from your planner, uh, BFG Planning, uh, which we thought were good suggestions. We had made them at that meeting. Um, Mr. Fish had actually prepared some plans, which we looked at and which were shared with you, and we liked what we saw. 
So, so this board had, uh, rather than closing the hearing, had continued it, even though you were aware of what the numbers were because we were able to figure them out that evening. But my understanding is you continued it so you could ha give the public an opportunity to look at it, and frankly, so you might have a few more minutes to look at it. Uh, you since have been provided with a revised A1 plan and uh, a list of the, the variances that uh, we're requesting, which I'll run through again quickly in a little while. Um, the Mr. Krakow, the architect, is here this evening. Mr. Murray, who's uh, one of the principals, is here also. So in case you have any, any specific questions for any of them. Um, the, the A1 plan, basically what was changed was there was a, uh, the, a small retail space was added to the elevation as you look at the building from the right adjoining the Angelillo building. Uh, that will most likely be Mr. Murray's personal office because it's kind of small to be renting out. Um, and therefore, the tandem parking spaces that were suggested by Mr. Fish were made a little smaller. Uh, the only other change that was made was we moved the dimension because I recall member um, Palladino was a little concerned about the number of spaces and counting. And it was a, uh, it was, it was a measurement line that was there, not uh, a space line. So that was moved over to make it abundantly clear. It was moved two or three spaces in to make it clear that that's what it was there for. And there was also a line drawn on that space to clearly show that it's a parking space. Um, the front of the facade uh, no longer has the appearance of a fourth floor, even though we are looking for a fourth floor, except for the elevator retail uh, and the, re the elevator and the stair space that's in the front. Um, again, it's not a full fourth floor. We, we, we know this is a three-story. Uh, three stories are permitted in the zone. Uh, we are asking for part of a fourth floor. It's basically the back part of the building, nothing in the front. Uh, we think it creates a nice transition to the block. Uh, the Angelillo building, which is next door, which is uh, a fine square brick building, which is well-maintained and attractive. Uh, we think it's in character with that. It's actually probably slightly shorter than that based on our measurements, though we don't have the exact measurements for the Angelillo building. Uh, the Angelillo building does have four full stories. Um, and we're not faulting them for that. They've been there for years. Uh, our building is slightly lower than that. Uh, than Angela and but more importantly, the proposed building, including the fourth floor, still complies with the maximum height requirement in that zone. So even if we only had three stories, it could still be the same building. It would still be the same height along Main Street. It would still look the same that as this proposal and this front elevation could still look the same because it still meets the height requirement. So when we're asking for the fourth floor, the fourth floor is at the back of the building. You're not going to see it from the road. The folks behind are still going to see an attractive building. It's one or two houses in the back that may see it. And you may see it when you come down terrace also, because it, it is going to be at the back of the building. Um, reducing the proposal to three stories, as I said, doesn't change the visual impact of the proposed building. Um, and they could build it as of right tomorrow. Um, without needing any, any variances, it would still have the same, we could come in with the same elevation, it would still look the same, it would be three stories, at, but it, would, it, uh, it meets the height requirement. Um, I remind you again that this is a difficult site. There is a lot of rock on the site. There are significant elevator, e elevation changes. Uh, there's, there's a mountain on the back half of the site. Uh, there's significant groundwater, which is one of the reasons we're not uh, drilling underground. And th there, as I said, there's a mountain. Um, this is not the, the same property does not have the topography or the, the composition of the other newer buildings along that side of the street, um, some of which were actually built. There, there is one building along the street, one on that side of the street, that has underground parking. That property was the site of, uh, of an excavation of a, a proposed project that failed probably 20 years ago. And there was a large hole in the ground, and it was actually backfilled. So the builder there just basically took out the backfill again. It wasn't a matter of cutting into rock and dealing with water and everything. Um, I, it, for just a quick summary of the approvals we're, we're seeking, and I did write it down in the, in, as an attachment to my cover letter last week, uh, we're asking for you to permit the use of not less than 37 parking spaces and that there be shared parking. There will be no reserved or designated spaces. We'll have stickers or hang tags to ID all residents and commercial tenants, except, as, as recommended by Frank Fish and BFJ, uh, the four tandem spaces will be reserved for those units that have three or four bedrooms. A and again, we will poll those folks to see if they have two cars, they'll get assigned to those spaces, and those spaces will be assigned, so that way we know we'll have the best use, and there won't be issues with the tandem parking then. 
Um, another, the next variance would be for the, and I've been, in, we had applied for a variance for the 9 by 18 size because the code in most cases read 9 by 20. Bill Williams pointed out to me this week that in 2013 the village actually changed the, the size of spaces to 9 by 18 even though it wasn't reflected in all places in the code. And in the text for the BR zone it still says 9 by 20 which is why we had applied for the variances. Bill has told me that isn't necessarily what applies. The, the other section does apply. So, so that means at this point we don't need a, a variance for the 9 by 18 size, but we do need a variance for the, for the eight tandem spots, which are only going to be 9 by 15. And Frank Fish suggested that that was okay because the folks who are in the same apartment, they, they can park bumper to bumper. It doesn't matter. They really don't need people. Not everyone's going to have a Chevy Suburban that they have to park back to back there. Um, so, so at this point, we just need uh, approval for 9 by 15 for the eight tandem spots. And, and again, while it's not a code requirement in the past, this board at, at Mr. Fisher's recommendation has asked that there be at least a 20-foot wide aisle in between the parking. So we're continuing to show it as a 24-foot aisle. Um, as far as the FAR 1.2 is required, we're going to be providing 1.83. Um, it had gone down. It went up slightly with the return of the retail, but we did take away the community rooms on the top floor. So it, it's basically ended up at 1.83. Uh, as for the side yard, there's a side yard. On Terrace Place, the, the way the code reads is you don't need a side yard, but if you have a side yard, you have to have six feet. Um, in this case, the planning board, in, in one of the earlier iterations of this project, had asked that we make the sidewalk there six feet wide. There's only a three-foot sidewalk now. So they wanted it to be the same as the front. So that required us to, to have a setback, a three-foot setback. So that's why we're asking for the three-foot setback um, variance because uh, we are going to have a three-foot setback and a six-foot sidewalk there. As to building coverage, uh, Bill has asked us to apply for a variance for building coverage, uh, though it's questionable if there's even a requirement. There's a chart which doesn't seem to have any link to any sections of the code, which seems to limit the building coverage in this zone to 50 percent, and we have 77 percent. Um, next, it's not a variance, but the, this board has the authority to authorize the joint use of the parking spaces for residential and retail use because it's a mixed-use building. So, so again, this is not a variance, but we're asking for your approval to do that. Um, and, and finally, we're asking for a special permit for 20 residential units and not more than 2,642 square feet of retail space with not more than two retail um, or commercial uh, units on, on the first floor. Um, it's respectfully submitted that the standards for granting the requested area variances, as detailed by me at the earlier meetings, have been met in all respects and that the variances should be granted. Further, uh, the reduction in the FAR and the increase in the parking spaces, actually there was a decrease in the required number, but we've actually increased the number from 33 to 37. Uh, so that actually decre decreases the substantiality of the of that um, requested variance. Um, again, this is not a first time look at this site by the Tuckahoe Zoning Board. The board had previously granted variances and special permits for two different proposed projects at this site. Um, I would respectfully submit that there has been no material changed facts or circumstances that will provide a basis for reaching a different determination than that which reasonably and rationally supported the prior approvals. Um, to, to date, we have not heard any community opposition to this proposal. Uh, now, with respect to the Mr. Leo's letter, um, uh, I noted that um, I never said that the planning board had approved this project. We had met with Antonio Leo alone, not with, and there were other people at that meeting also, not with members of the planning board because it wasn't an official meeting, it wasn't a work session. We wanted to get his reaction. Um, he saw an earlier plan. He didn't see this plan. We haven't been back to him since we, we've been to you. Uh, the plan that was shown to him very clearly showed floor plans for a fourth floor. It very clearly showed fourth four-story elevation. In fact, it had windows across the front of the fourth story, unlike the plan that we currently, those, those windows are now gone. It did actually show that. So he saw a, uh, a four-story elevation. So for him to now say that the planning board has a problem with it when the planning board didn't meet, unless they've been having meetings, they're not supposed to have meetings because they weren't noticed, which of course I'm not going to allege that. They. Um, the planning board has never seen that. As far as I know, he may have seen this at the meeting, but that was not presented to him. He had seen the four, the four stories. The plans were submitted. The plans were modified for the parking area 
following Mr. Fisher's recommendation of his office because we met with uh, him and Noah from his office, Noah Levine. Uh, so the plans were changed. Those plans were then shared with Mr. Williams, Frank Fish, and Gary Gertzen, and I, and I have those emails, and I asked if they could forward it to him, Mr. Leo. As, as a matter of practice and policy, I don't contact board members directly, just like I don't contact you, I don't contact the planning board. I do always do it through Bill. So we had in contact directly. So I'm a little <coughs> disturbed at this late date that he's saying we when we only met with him, and it's a little disturbing that he's taking a position when he actually did see a four-story plan there, and we have the, the emails that show that it was forwarded, and um, basically he didn't give permission, but we were advised by the village's consultant to go ahead and go to the zoning board based on that. And again, I'm not saying they approved it, but they did see it. It's not as if they hadn't seen it. Um, and that was just to, to clarify that. I would obviously welcome any questions from either the board or the public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marin. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Mr. Marin at this time? Okay. At, at this time, we're going to continue the um, uh, public comment section. So if anyone would like to address the board on 100 Main Street, I encourage you to uh, come up at this time. Please state your name and address. Sure, I'm Claire Matola. I live at 43 Terrace Place. We are one of the one or two houses on the mountain that Mr. Marin has referred to. Um, my husband, John Lambert, and I want to reiterate, as we have been stating since the building was first proposed, that we are very much in favor of Mr. Murray's plan. Um, he's been nothing but um, helpful and respectful to my husband and our kids. We also want to make very clear that we are not in favor of the plan unless someone tends to the parking issue. There are six parking spaces that are unrestricted, and I can assure you, I know that last time you met, someone had some photographs that they took. I have photographs that I take regularly of the folks from Bronxville that come and park on our street. There's not enough parking. And I want to make clear that you will be decimating the livelihood of the two houses on the block who don't have driveways. We will be absolutely mortified by this. It will not fare well for the value of our property and for our livelihood. We've lived here for six years. We have no intention of leaving. So please only approve this if this is carefully tended to, whether it's communicated to the other members of the village board um, to have permit parking there, whatever the case may be. But please do not approve this plan unless you've tended to the property value of those two homes. Again, I want to reiterate that Mr. Murray has been nothing but communicative and helpful, and he has our best interest in mind. But I need for the village to join him in that effort and taking our family's well-being into account. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to address the, uh, the board at this time? Great. At this time, I'm going to uh, close the uh, public comments on 100. Make a motion. Uh, on 100 Main Street. So I will make a motion to close the uh, public comment section. Second motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So the uh, the public portion of uh, for 100 Main Street is closed now, and the uh, I guess the application is complete. Um, so we will um, consider. Obviously, this is an extremely important project for the village. Um, there's, there's several different variances that need to be um, considered, and um, we're going to take time to, um, to digest everything that we've learned over the last several months. As uh, Mr. Marin said, this has been before us, and we've received a lot of feedback from the community, and um, we will um, you know, consider that and come back with uh, our recommendations and decisions uh, shortly at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you next month. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right, at this time, I'd like to move on to the uh, second item, which we're going to, um, uh, the second item will be 44 Fulling Avenue. Uh, we have an area variance for a new pergola.
Hello. Hi, good evening, Chairman and Board. I'm uh, Louis Fusco, landscape architect, uh, representing Nate and Katrina um, uh, Lynn regarding the variance, uh, the request for variance for a pergola. Um, the site where uh, the, re the required um, allowance for a pergola in this area would be 72 square feet and a height of seven and a half feet. Um, if it is outside of 10 feet from the existing residence. Um, due to the constraints of the particular site, um, you can see on the plan, it's a very odd triangular pie-shaped property with setbacks in um, and a sloping hillsided backyard. So based on those constraints, the pergola had to be moved in much closer to the house, which uh, doesn't allow us to reach that 10-foot distance out. Um, there's an existing bluestone patio. This pergola is an open structure, uh, four wood columns, uh, full wood lattice top pieces that's going to be sitting over a dining room table. Um, the total square footage of the proposed pergola is 188 square feet. Um, and it's at its highest point is nine foot two inches off the existing lower patio and actually less than six feet though from the rear yard which slopes up in a, in a wall. There's a photos down below uh, of this which I could show the audience as well. Would, would you mind um, showing the, the photos? Just put them on the easel so we have an easier time. Okay, the um, pergola mic Micro microphone. The pergola will be sitting. Um, you could take it out. Behind. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. The pergola is planned to sit um, right in this area here above the bluestone. The sloping rear yard, that back triangle, comes up into this area here. Uh, this wall is about three and a half feet high back here all new bluestone patio that was uh, installed within the last year. And the pergola will be sitting in this location right behind. And uh, as the elevation shows here, there'll be a dining room table underneath that, some lighting uh, components and some sound speakers in there. This photo here shows it looking in from uh, the other side property line. And this is looking back towards the step entrance to the backyard and the patio is around the side here. So it's a very tight, constrained backyard with the triangle and the slope. So it was really the only location that we could uh, locate the structure. Um, from our end, we don't feel as though I think that the, the um, pergola is not outside of the character of the neighborhood. We feel that the, um, the variance that we're asking for is a minimal one. It's not a permanent hard structure. Uh, it's not changing from the environmental point of view. Uh, any water that is landing on the patio is still going to be landing on the patio go to going into the drainage system that's already in, in place. There's an elaborate rain garden planting situation next to it. So we think from an environmental and a visual uh, point of view, it really is not having any hardship to anyone else in the neighborhood. And we think that the, the actual um, benefits to the neighbor, to the actual homeowner, is not taking away any, uh, anything from anyone else in the neighborhood. So on, on those grounds, we would hope that you would uh, receive this application favorably and open it to any questions from you or to homeowners. Great, thank you. And I, I just want to clarify for the uh, for the residents. The reason the pergola is, is before us is the zoning code um, suggests that any structure that is more than 72 square feet um, or more than seven and a half feet tall gets approval. Obviously, the uh, the village does not want gigantic greenhouses or sheds or those type of things to be erected in someone's backyard without approval from the zoning board. So. Um, this you mentioned is 144 square feet. Is that right? 188 square, 188 square feet. So it's it's larger than what is permitted as of right, and that's the reason uh, it's in front of us. Um, does anyone have any comments well, at this? Clarification: point? This is a completely open structure. Completely open. Completely open. Uh, air and water and everything can come through. Great. At this time, uh, I'm going to make a motion to open the uh, the public hearing on uh, on uh, this. Uh, well, what is this? 44 Foling Avenue. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Would anyone from the public like to comment on uh, this application? Please.
My name is uh, Jim Murtaugh. I reside at 47 Fulling Avenue across the street <coughs> from the house. And uh, I'm definitely in favor of the project. Um, <coughs> the architect um, mentioned the, about the irregularity of the lot. But the, the lot is, is um, virtually triangular with the wide part uh, on Fulling Avenue. So that <coughs> more than half of the yard property, maybe 60, 70 percent, is on the side yard. <coughs> and the, um, the slope of the uh, land raises anything in back to, to view of the street. So the, um, <coughs> there's a little more priority uh, than usual than <coughs> might be the case in developing of the uh, backyard. And um, in order to, uh, be, uh, the uh, property faces the, s the uh, east, face the backyard faces the east, the rising sun. So it gets most of the sunlight, of course, in, in the morning hours in a direct overhead. So the, um, <coughs> the placement of the pergola uh, is about, it's selected by that. It's the only place to have privacy and a little bit of the sun. And um, <coughs> also the, uh, um, <coughs> they have heating elements in, in that roof which uh, are suspended from the, the louvered roof. Otherwise it might <laughs> scorch it. And, or <coughs> it also <coughs> proximity to it below might scorch the people sitting at the table underneath the uh, roof. Um, so that's just say necessitates a little higher height than usual. And um, I, I think it's a very, uh, and, and the, uh, the architect mentioned they had a, <coughs> um, well, you mentioned to me before the meeting, they had a uh, more or less cut out that patio from the hillside because uh, in the expansion of the uh, house a couple of years back, the already small patio area was further shrunken. <coughs> and that's the problem. If you go back, you, you have a rising situation and you have to have a retaining wall, of course, like that. So I, I believe this is an optimum plan for, for the use of that uh, patio for the family. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to address the board on 44 Fulling? Come up, Sheila. Yeah, we have your letter too, but oh, it's <laughs> you good, good evening, Chairman, board members. I just wanted to go on the record. I didn't know if I was going to be able to attend the meeting or not. Uh, my property is directly behind the um, the project that you're is before you this evening. Uh, just for the record, I'm fully in favor of it. It's, it's beautiful and it doesn't, um, doesn't detract from any of the, the homes. In fact, I think it's wonderful and I would urge all of our neighbors to you know, enhance their properties as such because it benefits the whole neighborhood. So I just wanted to, I would urge you to approve it. I think it's a good thing and I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank, thank you. you very much. Would anyone else like to address the board? All right. Um, I, I, you know, I would agree with the two comments uh, that were uh, before us. You know, I personally drove by uh, the property, and I think many of our members have yes. as well. Uh, it's, it's an attractive property. It's clear that the people are um, uh, trying to enhance the neighborhood and, and beautify their own their own space, um, and and so I'm definitely in favor of it. And um, I think we have a motion that we're going to go I think for. You need to make a motion to close the public yes. hearing now. Perfect. Okay, so let's make a motion to uh, close the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, the public hearing is closed. Um, Janice, do you want to uh, make a motion for secret approval? Yes. Um, the application for an area variance requested by Nathan Lynn, whose address is 44 Fulling Avenue, Tuckahoe, New York, Section 30, Block 1, Lot 27, for relief from the following section of the zoning code, section 4-1.1.4, accessory uses, project construct a 200 square foot wood pergola over an existing stone patio. The CEQA resolution. Based on this application as submitted, this Zoning Board of Appeals finds and determines that, one, the action taken herein 
is an unlisted action subject to the requirements of CEQA and its implementing regulations. Two, the Zoning Board of Appeals is in possession of all information reasonably necessary to make the determination as to the environmental significance of the proposed area variance application. Three, that the action taken herein shall not have a significant adverse impact on the environment and it is declared that a negative declaration is hereby adopted with regard to this action. And we should vote. So I will second that motion and uh, Nancy, can you call a roll for the vote, please? Member Ringwald. In favor. Member Palladino. In favor. Member Berendez. In favor. Chairman Scalzo. In favor. Do you want to make a, a second motion now? Um, a second motion, be it resolved that the application for an area variance for the construction of a 200 square foot pergola over an existing stone patio is granted <clears throat> as the benefit to the applicant of the area variance outweighs the detriment to health, safety, and welfare of the neighborhood. The applicant has demonstrated through its submissions and presentation that it has met all aspects of the five-prong test to the satisfaction of the board. Great. I will second that motion. Um, can we call the roll, please? Member Ringwald. Approved. Member Palladino. In favor. Member Berendez. In favor. Chairman Scalzo. In favor. Congratulations, guys. Uh, we look forward to seeing it, uh, seeing it built. All right, thank you. We, now we are going to come to our um, our third item for tonight, which will be 73 Main Street, which is uh, the new Subway restaurant, which is asking for a parking variance. Uh, the public um, the public uh, hearing was continued to uh, to tonight from last meeting. So first, before we uh, bring the public up, we're going to ask the applicant to come forward and discuss uh, their application. Good evening, Acting Chairman and members of the board. I'm Leonard Brandis, the architect for the Subway uh, restaurant that's going to be we're proposing here. Uh, this is Frank Medeo, who is a local person who wants to open this deli restaurant. Frank, where do you live? You Great. Thank you. Uh, did go to the school here, <laughs> so he is part of this, he is part of this town. All right. <laughs> Uh, what we are seeking is a variance for a parking space. Uh, we have the meeting earlier that the zoning board had requested that if we can reduce this from, we, we're required to have four parking spaces under the zoning code. Uh, we were actually able to obtain another space, so we now have three parking spaces that we can require and that we need a variance now for one parking space. The areas on Main Street where there is a lot of parking in the area, the parking spaces that we've got are in this lot next door to the area. So employees can be right there so we're not taking up any spaces on the street itself uh, I'm open for comments great does anyone have uh... so uh, currently the uh, um, what what's in the uh, the proposed location right now or what has it been uh... there was a law office there originally and it had been the law had moved up I believe the landlord is here with us he stepped out of course at the right time uh, and he is have the loss, and the loss is now upstairs only, and he has now right leased the space. There's two parts to the space itself. Uh, this is, I believe, a nail salon next door, and mm -hmm. we're taking the space on the other side. So it is an empty space. Uh, most buildings do require some sort of parking, even though it's pre-existing the code when this was built. Obviously, there was no parking requirements at the time when the building was uh, put together. So, uh, but to be clear, this is a pre-existing building. Pre-existing. Pre storefront that's already there yes this is not a new pro new subject new not a new property it is existing and we just need parking for our project and whatever store was there before presumably need parking as well exactly. and so okay thank you thank you <clears throat> i have a question uh, lenny if you or the applicant were to have four 
spaces, you would not even be in front of the zoning board. Is that correct? That is correct. All right. But there is but, economics involved as well. And it does because an economic yeah. hardship that having to get three spaces is putting us really to a maximum limit to make this a profitable business. And that's, that's my second question. Can you get a fourth space or there is no fourth space available? We have not been able to get a space at this time. Uh, okay. And we feel that once again, cost wise, it's really getting very expensive uh, on a monthly basis to maintain these spaces. Okay, so you're looking for a 25% reduction. Yes, we it's are. Basically, that's why you're in front of this board. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Bill, can you clarify how we, um, as a village, will enforce this? Um, whether they actually maintain these spaces? Because from what I understand is they'll be leasing these spaces from someone else. Um. <clears throat> Correct, and we have a letter from them now from High, High Point Property saying that they do have an agreement. So as the agreements expire, we'll contact them to renew them and supply us with a copy of it. Great. Right, that, that letter was addressed to me. It was March 12th from Gus Demopoulos, who's the owner of the property, who's here tonight. And he, uh, in his letter, he said that as long as this lease remains in existence, those parking spaces will be available. And I understand from Mr. Demopoulos that there is another space available. So, uh, good please, evening, everyone. Um, Can you state your name? And yeah, sure. Yeah. My name's Gus Demopoulos, uh, High Point Properties. My company owns the building. Um, we previously made arrangements for them to, I, I own a number of spots in the Cameron and Van Dusen lots, um, and um, through coordination with the clerk's office, I uh, basically lease them the two spots in Van Dusen, which is the letter Mr. Gertz and Mr. Williams are referring to. Uh, recently, I gave them, well, recently, meaning five minutes ago, gave them another uh, parking permit for the Cameron lot. Um, and in furtherance of my letter and my representation to the board is provide, as long as they hold a lease with, with my company, those spots will be renewed annually for them. And as the town, in essence, once you hold the permit, you have the right to renew annually without, as long as you abide by the terms and conditions and pay them, obviously. So as long as there's a lease, they'll have them. Great. Thank you very much. Can I, can I bring the applicant back up? I, I had one other question. How many employees do you intend uh, will be working uh, at your shop uh, on a daily basis, kind of per shift? What, what kind of what you, um, kind of min and maxes? Okay, well, I'm um, working there full time, so um, I'll be the full time. There will probably be a couple of part time workers in the beginning. Um, so it, and my it, wife also. So will that be uh, two employees in there, nine employees in there, 20 employees at a time? Two employees at a time. Roughly? But in the, like, the lunch hour. Will be two to th three two to four? Two employees hour, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But not much It'll more than? Shifts. No, not more, not more than Not more than three or four? Not more or than three, definitely not. Because obviously we're looking at a parking variance here, and so one thing we're considering or need to consider is the number of employees that may be there. Obviously, if it's a large project. It won't be more than three. Okay. And also, we clarified the uh, delivery, which was of concern that the delivery is done how often? The major delivery to the That's once a week. And off hours. Off, off hours. hours. When we say off hours, what do we mean exactly? They can be at, in the evening time after the major traffic is through the town, so we're not blocking any traffic where we can park right up in front of the building so that it will not disturb traffic. It usually takes about 20 to 30 minutes to offset the truck to unload the truck. So we are looking for a quiet time when we can just go back and forth into the building from the street. So, so when we say delivery here, we're talking about the delivery of goods to the shop. Um, do you intend to offer delivery services, uh, you know, bring sandwiches to people or, um, you know, like a pizza delivery, obviously, That's you know, that sandwich? That is possible, but in the beginning, definitely not. I mean, I, it's not really the priority right now. One of the main reasons for the location is because of the amount of the people, the, the foot traffic. Yeah. And uh, the company, the main company, has done demographics and looked at everything, looked at other spaces in town that did not meet their approval because of the foot tra lack of foot traffic. So this has become very important. And this is a major foot traffic area. There are a lot of people that live in the area that have apartments. There is a lot of businesses and offices, and medical buildings down the end. So that, that's really what we're looking for. Uh, Lenny, I have one question. Last month I had asked if there was a possibility that the applicant would provide a separate trash receptacle outside of the subway, and you said that was a good idea, you would consider it. Is that 
uh, in the plans? Fresh receptacles and actually I can. I think you're talking about receptacles for people who well, people eat. Yes, for yes. People eat eat on the outside. On the outside. outside. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, we will provide. No question. Okay. If, if the town requires, we certainly can provide for people if they want to throw garbage out as they walk out. Absolutely. Uh, once again, this is not really many. We don't have much in terms of seating there. We're looking for basically takeout. So most likely everything's going to be bagged and being walked out. But for those that are, you know, take up having a drink and they want to dump it, we do want to have. We want to keep the place neat. Also, we don't want it to be a dump. Right. You know, the signage is also, we're not going to be doing a big plastic subway sign. This is going to be a nice wood sign that's going to fit more in the character of the town. So we're not looking for something that's going to look uh, a cheap commercial space. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. So we are going to continue the uh, the public hearing here. Um, before um, I ask if anyone wants to address the board, uh, we did receive two letters um, that I want to put into the record. Um, I'm not going to read them, but one is from... Um, uh, Denise Lucas of the Parkway Heights Civic Association, uh, and the other is from Sandra Reyes Guerra, um, who, um, and both uh, letters are opposed to a subway uh, sandwich shop. Um, I guess they are, uh, you know, concerned about putting out small businesses. They're concerned about the village's character and identity. They're concerned that uh, this will open um, additional fast casual McDonald's type places. They're worried about. Um, uh, traffic increases uh, as well and so those are officially in the uh, in the in the record and if someone wants to read them they can uh, they can go to Bill's office to uh, to see those um, at this time I'd like to uh, ask anyone uh, in the public if they'd like to come up and address this the subway uh, application for uh, 73 Main Street Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I'm Sheila Clark. Um, I have come with the five points that you have just referred to. Denise Lucas is the chairman of Parkview Heights Association. Um, there are concerns, not just from our area, which we feel eventually if, if um, cars start to cut through Dante as they are going up Fairview now, that that could be a major problem. It could certainly affect, neg have a negative impact on Parkview Heights. Um, unless you would prefer that I not, I'd like to read the five points which you have. Um, <clears throat> Go ahead, please. I think that, you know, um, we just like to have residents of the village who might be walk, uh, watching here. And it's not, you know, it's not, it's, it's fast food is one of our problems. and. You know, going back, I just want to say this, going back to when I was on the board, we were going to write um, language such as the town of Eastchester has and, and the village of Bronxville, and we decided not to, that we felt we could control um, what comes in that would impact uh, the traffic as well as the charm of, of our community with not granting variances. And so that is... Um, something that I think is done often by this board. Uh, I understand the board's wanting to attract businesses to come in to help lower tax rate or keep it even, but I think there's another side to the story as well. I've lived here for 30 years, and of course, everybody's taxes go up and so on. So when he, with, with that, let me just read these five points, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> tax revenue. Tuckahoe is small mom and pop shops along Main Street that sell the same kinds of food items that Subway does. Examples, Nikki's Deli, Cafe 72, Quarry Restaurant, Swirl and Joy, Fresco Supermarket, Bellagio, Bentley's. Subway will draw customers away from these shops. Some have been in our village for many years. Fewer customers at their shops means fewer sales. Fewer sales mean loss of revenue and eventually the loss of current taxes that these shops now pay. You will sacrifice current revenue for short-term gains since you will inevitably lose some of the smaller shops. Number two is village, village character and identity. And that will be lost as each mom and pop sh shop closes. Each small shop provides a different unique atmosphere that appeals in a different way to each of our villagers. This gives Tuckahoe its small town charm. 
and it is the reason so many of our villagers choose to stay here. Our village's character identity helps to keep property values up. Subway offers none of this unique charm or atmosphere. It is a cookie cutter chain that can be found anywhere in the United States. Town ordinances prohibits fast, casual food chains, and as you know, in 2013, our town of East Chester passed an ordinance to keep such shops out of the town. The reasons included economic challenges to food shops that are already in East Chester and the loss of individuality to those shops um, that, that the shops create for East Chester. Subway is such a shop, fast and casual. Bronxville, our sister village, also prohibits these kinds of chain shops. Why shouldn't Tuckahoe follow its sister municipalities and aim to bring a higher end product to our village residents? If you allow the subway chain, you will not be able to stop other national chains that decide to locate in Tuckahoe. Traffic will increase, number four, traffic will increase. Study from recent current pro projects show as many as 45,000 vehicles per week passing the east and west corridor. It can only get worse. And I can tell you going back about 15 years when we did a traffic study, which was the last one prior to this one, there were approximately 17,000 cars per week. That's increased to 45,000 cars a week and approximately 9,000 cars a day. That's, that's in a 15 year period, pretty substantial. And as I mentioned, the cut throughs, they are cutting through up Fairview and around to eliminate having to go through that traffic light with the bottleneck at Maine. And I think also that what I'm very concerned about is the folks that live on Dante Avenue, which is part of Parkview Heights, having to deal with traffic as they find their way through Circuit Wallace or whatever they do, there is a way to go through that would get you to the Bronxwood Parkway or wherever you might be going heading north. And then the, the last point is the moratorium on subway application and similar applications like East Chester, the village board, can call for a moratorium on chain shops and pass regulations to protect our village charm, our character, and our identity. So I would hope that you would take all of these into consideration. I've lived here 30 years. I know when I came here, when I moved here, what it was. I know as a realtor for many, many years, people would call and say, I'd like to look in Bronxville, but not in Tuckahoe. It's not that way now. People would love to live in Tuckahoe. As prices go up, some can't afford it, but I would hope that you would take that into consideration and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Would anyone else like to address the board? I, um, <clears throat> I can't help but agree with, every, with a lot of the things that Sheila just said. Um, I have not been a resident of Tuckahoe for 30 years. I don't live in Tuckahoe. Um, it's only been a year and a half since I've been here, but I more than anybody believe in Tuckahoe. I invested a million dollars in this town, okay? Um, Everyone told me, ah, Tuckahoe is a quiet town. It's never going anywhere. Bronxville over here, East Chester over here. I believed in it. I bought a vacant building that had no tenants in it. It was completely gutted and it was disgusting. I bought it. I put my office and moved my five staff members from East Chester to Tuckahoe. Um, as Mr. Williams or Mr. Gertzen can tell you, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building a first rate office on the second floor. Um, <clears throat> I replaced a roof, I beautified my building. This spring I'm going to try with the building department's approval to get a nice backyard done. Um, I spared no expense. Uh, I actively continue to look for investments in Tuckahoe because I believe in this town. I haven't been here for 30 years. I, I wasn't born here. Uh, I wasn't stuck here because my parents were here. I saw a town that had potential um, that I believed was undervalued and I came and invested here. Since I've done that, in um, a year and a half ago, I have a vacant space that I can't rent. I've hired three separate brokers. I've decreased the rent. I've actively sought out people to rent the space. Nothing. Um, the reason being is that while there may be 30 or 40,000 cars going up and down Main Street all day, they're not stopping. They're going right through. 
It's a traffic route. There's highways. I eat at uh, Mambo 64 once a week. I eat at um, uh, Dominic's Place the Quarry. I, um, I eat at the Tap House once a week. I go into Cafe 62 or 64, whatever it's called, every day. Okay, yeah. And let me tell you something. Every one of those businesses are hurting. Every one of them. Okay? I go to Quarry for lunch. There's two people in there. Okay? It's not that Tuckahoe is doing something wrong. It's just this is its time. Okay? The next five years are when this town becomes Eastchester and when this town becomes Bronxville. I believe in it so much, I have a million reasons to believe in it, okay? Bringing Subway to Tuckahoe is not hurting Tuckahoe. It's establishing Tuckahoe. It's what happens, guys. You go to Nassau County on, on the boulevard or you go to Manhattan, there are fast food restaurants. There are establishments with names, and I get it. Some of these places do a horrible job at upkeeping, and they have garbage everywhere, and they provide problems, and, and I get it. And, and, and if you read my lease with these people, it's a corporate lease, with, with not with these gentlemen. It's with the head of Subway. There are restrictions on garbage. There are restrictions on refuse. There are restrictions on signage. My building, you walk by it, it's beautiful. I'm not going to let them ruin it, okay? It's not going to lose the character of the village. I, 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 I sincerely believe it. I mean, walk up and down. There's a man dressed as the Statue of Liberty in front of a tax place that looks like garbage. It's embarrassing to me to have my clients walk in and see this man waving. I, I, I'm quite convinced he's not sober all day, okay? And, and we're talking about establishing a company that has 2,800 locations and is a billion dollar company and bringing it into the village. And we have not mom and pops, that's a joke. I mean, I find it hypocritical that we're here talking about the character of the village and we allow things like that to happen. We have the, the end of the block there by, by, by in that mall there. With the, there's, there's garbage stores in it. it. It doesn't look nice. It doesn't do anything for our village, okay? Character and identity, quite the opposite. It establishes Tuckahoe for, and to establish it in its rightful place of where it's gonna become. Um, the lose smaller shops? Absolutely not. It's going to create buzz. It's going to create energy. It's going to create, oh, look at that. And people are going to be up and down. All these residents, where do they eat? I work till 7.30 or 8 every night. Everything's closed. Go get food. Who comes works in Manhattan late till 7 o'clock? Walk up Main Street. Where are you going to eat? Villagios. That's it. Okay? And Villagios is great. Best pizza in Washington, if you ask me. Um, I first came to Tuckahoe, and when they were renovating the building, um, I, uh, I used to pull up, I, and my office was at uh, Mr. Pepe's place in the Lord and Taylor Shopping Center. So I used to pull up, and I'd go to the meter, and the first day I was there, I went to go put change in the meter, and I was like, oh, this thing's broken. It doesn't have the zero, zero to put the thing in. One day, two days, three days, different meters. And I would say to myself, every meter's broken? I was too you know, much of a hurry and, and absent-minded to realize you got to press left and right. The point is, those meters in front of that building over there are always, there's always parking, okay? That's a bad thing, okay? Because when you pull into a town such as Main Street and there's always parking on the street, that means there's not enough business. That means there's not enough energy in a town. And I can vouch for that, my hand to God. I, I, I defy anybody to come there in the middle of the day tomorrow and not find parking from Villagios to 73 Main Street. There's always parking, okay? Uh, I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. Um, higher end product, you know, uh, Mrs., I forgot her last name, but uh, for, Clark. Sheila. All right. She said, bring a higher end product. Please, bring me a higher end product. I have a space vacant for a year and a half. And while I would love to have the gap come and rent my store or uh, 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 you know, some other high-end retailer. It's just not happening. This town is on the brink of breaking out. It really is. I wouldn't have invested this money if I didn't believe it. I haven't been a village, uh, Tuckahoe resident, but I've lived in East Chester for all my life. And I can tell you, it's going to happen. It's a question of when. But if we are narrow-minded about who we can let in and fast food, no fast food, why? These are successful businesses that don't go out, that don't go out of business. These are 
capitalized billion dollar company. It's a corporate lease. This isn't some franchisee throwing a couple of dollars at this. I have a, a 10 year lease signed with a billion dollar company. That's who we want. So, you know, I gotta respectfully disagree with everyone that thinks that this is gonna be bad for Tucko. I think it's quite the opposite. I think it's incredible for Tucko. I think it's finally establishing its rightful place. And if there are any restrictions that this board wants on something that fast food restaurants do or don't do that they're concerned about, I assure you, and I'll provide proof of that, I'll put that in my lease. I will make sure they don't do so. You want garbage receptacles? I'll amend my lease and I'll tell Frank that's getting done. Garbage receptacles. You want, you know, any reasonable expectation that this town has to make sure that this is, you know, a, 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 a good and clean place, I'll do and I'll stand by it. But I, I think that not approving this application is a mistake. Is it in my best interest? Absolutely. But it's also in the best interest of everyone that believes this town is going somewhere. So thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to address the board? Uh, please. I just have a question, actually. Sure. Um, Marilyn Mazzella, 28 Hollywood Avenue. I actually just have a question. We were talking a little bit earlier about what time deliveries would be made, and the answer was that it would be after hours. But the gentleman that was just speaking is referring to coming home from work late at night at past 730 and not having anywhere to eat, and that subway would be open. So I'm just wondering, what are the actual hours? Because that would also determine what are the after hours where these deliveries are being made. So uh, I'll answer what I know. That, that question's not before us, but I believe they said it would be 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. roughly uh, at the last meeting. Um, there are, of course, regulations within the building code about hours that restaurants can be open. And uh, to go past those hours, they'd have to go through the building department and get approval for that. But I believe 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. is allowed. Is that correct, Mr. Williams? That is allowed. I don't, I don't. I, I think, are you worried about traffic? I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to understand your concern or what, you, what you're trying to uh, get at. Uh, just, yes. just so that we're clear and you're on the record and yes. you're. I, I have lived in this village my entire life and I am home during the day. I am not at work. I drive through the village pretty much every single day. That street is crowded. There are trucks that come up and down Main Street all day long. And yes, you can find a parking spot. I, I was there today, I ate at the quarry for lunch. And yes, I found a parking spot, but there are many days where I've driven up and down Main Street and sat in traffic and sat behind trucks and couldn't find parking spots. There are doctor's offices over there. There are restaurants over there. There is a lot of traffic on that street and on the streets in the nearby area. And as Mrs. Clark said, I live in Parkview Heights, and I certainly, we have enough traffic in Parkview Heights that we never had before, and I certainly don't need any more traffic coming through because they're trying to avoid those areas. So my concern is, yes, you're saying deliveries are being made after store hours, but the quarry is also open, so whatever time your deliveries are being made, there are large trucks coming larger than what we would like to see in our small little village, coming to make those deliveries. Those are trucks that are being added to what's already there. W this is a small village. We're not trying to be East Chester. We're not trying to be Manhattan, where we want all of this fast food and, and all of that draw. That's not what this village is about, and that's not why people came here. If I wanted that, I would be living in White Plains or Nourishell, where all of that's available. But we live in a small town, a small village, that doesn't have that for a reason. It is a different character. It is a different feeling of your neighborhood. And if that's what people wanted, and I, I feel bad that you're not able to lease your building, but quite honestly, that's not my problem, and that's not why I would say, oh, approve it just because it's an empty store. It, it's got to be looked at as there's a lot of people that live in this village and they chose to live here for a reason. And there's concerns with that, that kind of traffic that is, I mean, even down in Crestwood right now, the traffic is horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous. And like I said, I'm home all day long. So if anyone wants to drive through the village all day long like I do, you'd see exactly what I see. 
So I just think that really needs to be addressed because it's a very big concern. Thank you. Uh, let the applicant come up. Uh, I just wanted to say that the deliveries will be once a week, and it could be like between in the morning, six to, it could be 6 to 7 in the morning, it could be after 9, so it won't be like in the, the peak hours, you know. It'll just be once a week. Great. Thank you very much. Please feel free to come up. Hello. Albert Stern, 14 Westview. Welcome back. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, the gentleman who just spoke uh, spoke about Tuckahoe breaking out um, through some kind of industrialization or some kind of generic uh, commercialism. I would say it, I would say that it would be the opposite. It would be breaking down because what you follow from uh, Subway is the next restaurant, which will go next to the Marriott. Will that be an IHOP? Will it be another chain? Um, will it be a Denny's? Who knows what it will be? But it will be another one of Main Street America's, the same thing you see in every, hi every commercial highway in America. And if this is what you want Tuckahoe to be, it's going to be fastly, rapidly changing into that direction. So just because you let one in here, doesn't mean that the others aren't going to come in. So you're really on dangerous territory here, I think. Um, and I could name other chains that could come in that would make you uh, turn red. Who knows what, what is going to come into Marbledale, but Marbledale will be much more impressed with the idea that Subway came in. So it opens up a door for all the rest of the chains in America. And there, is, there are very few chains between the Bronx and White Plains of a commercial eating establishment like this. So this is a great place, and they really can break out here. But I would say it's more like a breakdown. So uh, I think you should very seriously consider this. On another point, um, I want to mention that I've looked through your meeting minutes for the last two and a half years, and I've noticed that this board has granted all the variances that were requested. So there might be an exception, but generally you take all the variances and you pass them. So I think you better look very closely at this because your record is to provide for almost every variance. So this might be an exception you should really consider seriously. Um, as far as what Sheila Clark said, I agree with her completely. I won't go over all the details, but basically I find this a very, very major threat to a small town as it opens up a doorway for a lot of other problems. And so I think this should be one of your first times that you actually do turn down a variance. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Baker, 43 Filling Avenue. I was here last month when that gentleman spoke, and I agree with everything he says. I'm not going to reiterate it. I agree with everything that Sheila Clark said. And I started here 25 years ago from New York City to the Gentry, and I now live up in Gifford Park. I do agree we're entering a slippery slope if we allow a subway to come in here. We have a hotel coming up. We have another new building coming up. You're trying to turn a, a, a suburban area into an urban area. I didn't move to the suburbs to be back in New York City again. And there has been an increase in traffic in the 25 years that I've been here. Some days I go up 22, some days I go down 22, some days I'm going down Main Street. And there are many times that I do come home in the evening and I get my nails done, and I have to park around the corner. I go down to here to get my hair cut, I have to park around the corner. So business is coming back, but I don't want it to be in the subways. And to make characterizations about people who are trying to make a livelihood, I think that was kind of rude. About the man trying to make a living. Please, I please address, don't address the audience, please. Okay, you okay. can address the board if you want to say something, but. But next time stop you, someone when they you try can, to make generalizations. We, fair enough. Thank you. Any other comments? Mike, let him go. Thank you. 
Hi, I live on uh, 189 Dante Ave, and <clears throat> I just heard about and this. And what's your, what's your name? Oh, Al Maroon. Thank you. Um, so I just heard about this the other day. It was, through, you know, fortunately there's a lot of concerned citizens in our neighborhood who, uh, you know, went through the effort to inform us about this subway. Otherwise, I would never have known about it. Uh, when I heard about it, I was, um, I, I was not, uh, I was pretty upset. Uh, uh, as far as uh, a subway here, I think it's a bringing fast food places here to me is is selling out uh, our our neighborhood. Um, that's one of my main concerns. That I I get you know a, a few people here mentioned how the reasons why we came here. You know this guy here invested a million dollars. I invested three children and um, you know a profession and. I like getting off the train, coming home to a nice neighborhood. Just, just want to let you know that. Great. Thank you for coming. Thank you for speaking. Uh, Lenny, would you like to? Uh, just a couple of comments. And uh, one is that uh, there are other chains here. Right across the street is a Carvel that's been here for at least 25 years since I've been in the area myself. And there's also a Starbucks less than a block away. So there are chains that are, do exist within the town itself, uh, down the town area. So I don't think it's uh, out of character. The other thing also I'd like to just, in terms of the board, uh, we, the board does approve a lot of uh, boards. I, I'm before this board all the time. And one of the things is that you guys always negotiate. So I don't see that you just accept things, just so you realize. We negotiated from a 50% variance to a 25% variance. And I think that is what the board is supposed to do to help maintain. And I think you guys have been doing a great job with it. I just wanted to let everybody know. It's not that you just say yes to everything, even the uh, application for 100 Main Street. This has been negotiations back and forth. And I think, think people should understand that, that the idea is to let the town improve, let people maintain their houses, maintain their properties, improve their properties through helping and variances. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to, uh, you know, kind of address that point a little bit. I wouldn't characterize it as negotiations. Um, I feel that's a quid, quid pro quo type thing. Uh, first of all, everything we do is out in the open. It's done uh, at these meetings or it's done at work sessions. It's on the record. Uh, it's available for public review and public comment. Um, and I think we're very active about raising our concerns and being very direct with any applicants that come before us. Um, and they often react to that by changing their application and changing what they actually present to us um, because we are, uh, quite honestly, open and transparent, unlike, um, uh, well, I, I don't know, you hear other characterizations of other towns and other places that aren't quite as open or transparent, but um, everyone on the board that I work with is uh, very straightforward with applicants about where they, you know, where their concerns are, and as we get new information, whether it's from um, our legal counsel, our building department, residents, we take that into consideration and flow that information back to the uh, to the applicants. Um, and because of that, you know, generally, if they're, uh, what we do find is that if the applicant is unable or unwilling to um, uh, to kind of uh, address our concerns, that they often pull their application rather than bringing it to a full vote, um, or they address the concerns. Quite honestly. Um, the meeting is still open, so I'd like, you know, if anyone else from the public would like to speak at this time. Please. My wife spoke earlier. I'm still Mazzella, 28 Hollywood Avenue. Great. Um, excuse me? Great. Oh. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, the concerns I have are, I mean, there's, it's the traffic, it's the garbage. I don't know if anyone has been around. And Subway is not the greatest. There used to be one on uh, North Avenue near Rochelle. That has gone out of business. So if he thinks his lease is going to be good for 10 years, only if it goes out, only if it stays in business. There used to be a Subway right across the street from the uh, New Rock. That is no longer there. So that argument's specious. Um, they go out of business just like anything else. I'm sorry that he can't rent his space. However, this is a small town. Uh, I don't think we need to be, the nearest two subways are in White Plains and the rest are in the Bronx. Uh, 
I don't think we need to be the Bronx or White Plains. I don't think we should be the Bronx or White Plains. I came from the Bronx. That's why I'm here. Uh, as far as potential tax revenue, how much sales tax could you get off of sandwiches? So that's not an issue. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that this, I'm sorry that Sheila didn't put the, uh, the restriction in for fast food places like East Chester does and Bronxville, because then we wouldn't be having this argument. It, would be, it wouldn't be a variance on issue. It would be a completely non-starter. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to address the board at this time? All right, I'm going to make a uh, motion to close the public hearing. Or why don't we comment afterwards? Right. Or do you want to comment now? Yeah. Do you want to go? <clears throat> I just want to make a general uh, comment. Sheila mentioned about the rules within the village. And as you know, we are the zoning board. If Subway were to acquire four spots, Subway would not be in front of the zoning board right now. It would be approved. So uh, the public concerns that are expressed, I would recommend or suggest, hopefully, that the public approach the trustees and the mayor of this village if that is truly their concern. That is the type of store. Again, if Subway comes up with four spots, Subway is not even in front of this board. So I, I believe the onus is on the public to speak to the public officials here, those lawmakers that are all the trustees and the, the mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, I said the same thing uh, last month, okay? Uh, we don't make laws. We just vote on um, applications for variances, okay? Um, I understand everybody's concern, but this is a permitted business. Whether I agree with it or not, it's a permitted business. And all we have our ability is to vote on the variance, okay? And I'd like everybody to realize that. And if everybody has a concern whether we should have the same law as East Chester or Bronxville, okay, we are not the purview or the venue, okay, that that should be taken up with. That should be taken up with the village board and the village trustees. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I'd like to uh, close the uh, public meeting or public hearing. I'll make a motion to close it. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Should we flip it over? Hold it for me. I think at this point, um, you know, we the the last two meetings uh, for this, uh, we've heard a lot of comments from the um, from the community. Uh, I don't think I'm personally prepared to vote on this yet, so I think we're going to hold this over. Um, and we'll make a, uh, you know, we're going to think about it over the next month in our working session. And, um, uh, but at this point, the public hearing is closed and the application's in good order. So we'll be making a determination likely at the next meeting. So thank you everyone for coming and speaking. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, if we could, uh, if everyone could uh, exit, I'd appreciate it. We have one more uh, applicant up for tonight. Uh, we have, um, and our, our final uh, item is 56 Underhill Street, which is an area variance to widen the driveway. Would the applicant please uh, come to the uh, microphone? Sure. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman and Board. Uh, my name is Peter Constantine. I'm an attorney, and I'm here on behalf of my client, uh, John Puglisi. Uh, this is regarding an area variance uh, and the location of property, as you mentioned, is 56 Underhill Street. 
what I wanted to mention to the board, and I did submit the application uh, previously with a copy of the um, uh, the uh, the uh, survey plans that were uh, uh, provided. Um, this is a de minimis application here, and we're looking for a very, very small change and, and a widening of a driveway. Uh, this is a property that my client uh, and his family has owned since the 1890s, and more specifically, uh, the the driveway that we're discussing here tonight was was always used as a driveway, and the only thing we're dealing with is a small portion uh, of that driveway, which amounts to about 156 square feet, uh, is what we're talking about. Currently, right now, that driveway is uh, constructed of uh, paver blocks, um, and what we're looking to do is to continue, uh, as you see in the plans, the the, the section uh, that is now empty with uh, additional paver blocks. Uh, and as the board knows, there is a five-prong test that is used uh, in order to grant this type of variance, and we believe that we satisfy all those requirements and that the board should uh, ultimately grant our application. Uh, what we're dealing with here is, is a, uh, the, the increase that we're dealing with is actually going to conform uh, to, the, to the neighboring properties, uh, whereas their driveways uh, go from, um, uh, or actually go all the way up to the neighboring property lines. Uh, there are a couple neighboring properties submitted pictures of their driveways, uh, and actually some of those driveways are, are, are made of blacktop, uh, which is considered an impervious surface, as opposed to what we're doing here, uh, adding paver blocks. Uh, additionally, it's, it's a de minimis change, as I mentioned, because we're only looking at about 150 square feet uh, of, of an increase. Um, and, and, and again, what, what we're doing is, is actually going to be conforming to the rest of the properties in this neighborhood. Uh, this is not going to be a change that's going to impact uh, the neighborhood or the character of the neighborhood in, in, in any way. It's a very, very, very minimal change in, in terms of what we're looking for. Uh, I, I don't know if the board has any questions or, or, or any comments that they would like to ask. Yeah, I, um, so I'll, I'll just start out making a couple comments. So sure. when we're looking at area variances, and especially when we're looking at setback variances, probably the number one thing that we're always looking at is impact on the neighbors. Obviously, the reason you have buffer zones is so that you can have um, peace, quiet, uh, you know, between neighbors. You know, they, there's an old saying, high fences make good neighbors, uh, those type of things. Um, it's for, um, you know, smell, sight lines, water runoff. There's lots of reasons why area variances are put in or setbacks are put into um, the zoning code. And so anytime that there's changes or people are asking for a variance to that, we are always going to look at that very closely and, um, and uh, consider that closely. There's been a couple um, recent cases um, in the last year or so where we've had applicants that have asked for setback variances. Uh, one was at Hollywood Avenue where they had a, um, a swimming pool that was too close to the property line. We went and took a site visit there and we looked at how high their fence was and whether it was a see-through fence or, or a, uh, um, a uh, solid fence. In this case, it was four feet you know, solid fence between the two properties. Another uh, applicant was on Ridge Road uh, where they wanted a, um, a, a variance in the backyard and we had them put in Arbor Vitae so that it would screen basically between the two neighbors. So these are things that we're always considering with um, these type of area variances. That's um, extremely important. Uh, I think the other thing that's important is is the history of this uh, property, and it's important for everyone to understand. Uh, we have some pictures of what this previously looked like, uh, which I believe, um, you know, there was, what, four-foot-tall bushes there? Would, is, is, that, is that a fair well, characterization? I, yeah, I, I believe at one point there were some, some rose bushes that were in this area. Uh, I don't know the exact height of them. Uh, but, yeah, there were some rose bushes there. That, that, that is correct. But I, I will tell you this. That. So, um, what? Uh, Continuously, the, the, this this property uh, and, and 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 this particular section was always used as a driveway. Even even my client with with these bushes there, uh, and and unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. He's uh, he's uh, 
about 90 years old. He's, he's, it's difficult for him to, to kind of get back and forth. Uh, so unfortunately, he could not be here tonight. Uh, but he did indicate to me that he would, uh, even though there were these bushes there, he would literally drive his car up next to them in order for him to get items in and out of the garage and do those types of things. So I, I understand that there were some shrubbery that was there uh, so previously. I, I want to uh, enter these pictures. Um, these are pictures from the building department, is that correct, Mr. Williams? And um, when were these pictures taken approximately? Um, I'd have to look, the date may be on them. Were these taken before the work had commenced yes. on the driveway? So before he started to put the pavers in? Correct. I, I don't see, I mean, I don't know if you want to take a look, I don't see a date on the pictures. So what we have in, in these pictures, I believe, is the way the, um, the side area looked before work was commenced. Um, I think it can be characterized as um, a pretty solid wall of bushes, essentially, separating the two properties. Um, I and, just and again, ultimately, the, 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 another issue that we're dealing here is, is the pavers on the driveway are, are separating, and that is, is a, a reason why uh, we would like to add these additional pavers, and the reason why that shrubbery there was was removed is that there was work done uh, to the uh, to the wall which uh, abuts the property there. Uh, and and however, my client uh, that work uh, he was not allowed to do from the neighbor's yard. He had to end up doing that work. Did from he approach? Did he work with the neighbor? Did he approach the neighbor? I believe he yes. I believe he did uh, approach the neighbor. Um, so ultimately, his only other recourse was to remove those shrubbery. Uh, so this way he could do the work on his wall. Uh, and then at that point, uh, it ended up causing uh, the, the issue of the paver separating. So he then decided to, uh, to go the route of adding additional pavers there that abuts to the property line. And if you take a look at the, uh, at the plans, uh, the, the, if you will, the first section of the driveway actually abuts up to the property line. So all he's looking to do is kind of continue at the continue uh, that the rest of the way. I, I think aesthetically it'll look nice and it'll also serve the purpose of repairing uh, his driveway where the, where the blocks are separating. So uh, I also, I, I guess, uh, want to put on public record, um, the separation now it, between the properties, it, it used to be this uh, shrubbery and now it's a chain link fence. Is that correct? They put in a legal chain link fence, I believe they got approval for that. Is that correct? But it's a see-through chain link fence. Is well, that correct? Well, if I may, yes, that's part of the driveway, not the whole driveway. Again, if you remember, uh, and the plans bear that out, the first section of that driveway, the, the blocks go right to the property line. So when we're making that statement, I just want to make sure we're clear that we're only talking about the area where we're getting our vantage, not necessarily the whole driveway, because the whole driveway uh, that does not. Uh, but that fenced area is what abuts his neighbor's backyard area. His, the area that he uses as his backyard. That's where the chain link is. Yeah, yeah, yes, it's, yes the chain link fence that goes across the property line, correct. Originally, as I looked at the pictures, what was there before he did that work on the wall, and you'll have to explain why he removed the pavers the that curbed, that were provided a curb mm -hmm. for that original driveway, which also then allowed for the water to run down his own driveway and by removing those and subsequently doing the work, he then created a situation that potentially is creating a water problem for his neighbor. Well, I, I don't know if it's creating a water problem. I, I guess, I, I don't know if there's been any other kind of comment here that would indicate that there was a water problem that's been created. I'm not familiar with it. I don't know if there's any other meetings or something that I missed indicating that there is a water problem. But there were pavers that edged no, no, the I, driveway I understand that. No, that, that prevented that is the pavers from moving. Mm -hmm. So no, uh, I, 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 I understand that. I just don't understand the issue of, of, of the, the water. I, I don't know okay. if that's something. So, I, it seems as if you might be familiar with something that I might not necessarily be familiar with. So let, let's put that on the record. So Bill Williams, uh, I believe you received an email with a, um, with a video. Could you describe when you received, what you received? I believe it was March 10th. Okay. We received two emails of a video of the neighbor's water running through the wall and onto the neighbor's property. Okay. I, I and, was, what, and who did you receive those emails from? It was from the neighbor. The next door neighbor? Correct. 
And that was after the shrubbery and the curb, which held the bricks in and that they didn't move, that happened afterwards. Correct. As soon as we can find a way to get it onto a CD, we'll put it on a CD and make it available to everybody. So let's, let's, uh, for Unfortunately, I have not seen that yet. Okay. Let's I, I, I understand that it came to the board on March 10th. Uh, today being April 8th, I have not received a copy of that. I oh, so just to be clear, we well, it we actually saw got it to the building, building department. We saw it for the first time today uh, uh -huh. before this. Uh, we'll make sure that we forward that email to you, so you have a um, so you have the ability to okay. see it. Of course, we'll enter that into the public record. I don't exactly know how we enter a video, but I just please want to do add one thing. Yes, when you talked about the five prong test, you understand that by removing those curb pavers, this situation of the pavers moving was self-inflicted but I, 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 with that being said the, the 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 repair work that needed to be done to the to the wall there's no other way to feasibly do that uh, so it, it becomes a situation of of yeah unfortunately he, he, the, the 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 shrubbery and these pavers uh, had to be removed um, a point of clarification, by sure. widening the driveway, will we be adding any parking capacity? Well, it's such a de minimis widening that it really would not make any kind of effect regarding parking uh, uh, in, in terms of whatever, how many cars, however many cars can park there now, we'll be able to park there uh, uh, if, this, if the, this area gets widened. It's such a de minimis change that it, that it, it, it wouldn't even allow for for any additional parking, said another car could park there because of the the, the scope and size of it. And who park who parks there now? I just wanted. Well, there's no one that parks on the driveway. There is a garage that the 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 uh, the property uh, owner parks in the garage, but there they there's no one that parks. I, I guess sometimes they could potentially park on the driveway, but they typically park in the garage. And and I believe that it was characterized today that there th it's a three unit uh, building. And that right. um, all the uh, residents or renters um, need to park on the street because the landlord doesn't allow them to use the driveway. Is well, that correct? Well, it, it's correct because the landlord uses the, the, the garage. If he were to now allow a tenant to, to park on the driveway, it would kind of defeat the purpose because it's not wide enough to allow two cars to pass through. Even if the board is so inclined to grant this variance, it would not uh, uh, increase uh, uh, or give enough space to have two cars pass by. So, yeah, so un un unfortunately the, the, the tenants have to park on the street because the property owner uh, parks in the garage and they don't want a situation where a tenant is potentially blocking them. Great. Yes. Yeah, one of the things um, you keep mentioning that the pavers are separating and everything, okay? Yes. Even with the removal of the bushes, from what I saw with these pictures that were entered in just a few minutes ago, okay, there was a small curb which held all the pavers in place, and none of the pavers, pavers were separating. Why was that curb removed? It, okay. it, again, to do the work. He said uh, he was doing it for the wall. Correct, that's right. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. To, to, to um, all right, I, I just don't see it. I can understand the shrubbery being removed to work on the wall, but why move the, the curb? Well, ag uh, again, it's a similar situation. It's just a small curb. It was maybe six inches high and everything. That's it. Yeah, I, I believe it was done for, for access. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, another thing that this will allow, too, uh, again, whether or not the, the, the application is granted, but, but I guess the ease of, of, of ingress and egress in and out of the garage, now to be able to, to I guess, travel over uh, a, a, um, uh, a paved driveway as opposed to, I don't know, a, a dirt or, or, or gravel, it, it, with the way that it's situated right now, it would, it, it would improve uh, ingress and egress. Are you saying that a portion of that driveway that is out, abuts the garage is, was not paved? You're saying that the width of the driveway was not the width of the garage? Well, sure. The, well, when you talk about the width of the garage, you, you have to distinguish between the width of the opening of the garage as opposed to the, the I, I guess the width of the structure of the garage, if you will. So the, the, the opening of a garage, if you could imagine, it doesn't just abut to where the garage door is. A garage typically is, is a little bit wider than what the garage door is. So where the garage door is, yes, that area is paved. But again, when you're talking about pulling in and, and, and pulling out and those types of things, uh, you know, it's always beneficial to have some additional space. Is there any other questions or? None, uh, not for me. 
All right, thank, thank you. I, um, I'm going to make a motion to open the public hearing on, uh, on 56 under Hill Street. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Before we ask if there's anyone that comes up, I, I'd like to uh, put into record a letter that was received by uh, Henry Caparoso from 62 Underhill Street uh, regarding the driveway widening here. Um, basically, the characterization of this letter is that he is concerned about the already congested parking situation from tenants on the street um, and that if the widening of this driveway um, is being made in order to accommodate more tenant cars uh, and will relieve parking congestion on the street, then he, f he fully supports the endeavor. So um, I guess we're hearing that that's not the case, but um, that's what his letter says. And if um, Nancy has it and it's now part of the, the record. So with that, um, I'd like to open the meeting to uh, anyone from the public who would like to address this board. Come on up. Hello. John Fitzpatrick, 54 Underhill Street. I um, am the property owner directly next door and the sender of the video to uh, Bill Williams' office. I sent it the last time before your meeting I thought was occurring in March. So I have just a couple of things I'm going to give to you and I'm going to come back. Great. Thank you very much. It's two sets of copies of the same thing there. Uh, so I have just a couple of points here. I'm going to be brief. Um, I foiled the uh, statement of principal points also in the application from the attorney. And I realized that, um, you know, my neighbor is an elderly gentleman, so he couldn't be here this evening, and I understand that. And I think, though, that when you wind up with a zoning issue with neighbors like this, too, it's always better to have the neighbors there as opposed to an attorney who really doesn't know how the whole thing is necessarily transpired. And uh, so anyway, I read his statement of points. I think that, uh, you know, he's made sure that the premises are maintained and operated in harmony with the surrounding neighborhood. I think that um, if you take any time and look into the applicant's file that is actually in the building department. He's been in constant conflict with most of the neighborhood, including the neighbor on the other side, which is also, I mean, it's in the record that you can look at it. He's been, you know, he sued other people and uh, looked to take their house away, even board members possibly of this board here. Um, he's continually used this driveway located at his premises since they occupied the premises. I mean, that's not really a true statement in his uh, principal statement. They don't live at this particular facility. They live across the street, and it is a rental property. And I realize that most of the points you all brought up, he removed the paver course, that he removed the Belgian course that held the pavers together. He absolutely self-inflicted what he did there. And he as can you he, address the uh, the history the so, wall i can I, so we we have some pictures that show some night shrubbery yep um it's been alleged uh that he worked with you to consider whether um the wall was falling apart and how to repair that and and then as he uh, yes what happened so I got, I got, what um what is the history of the the shrubbery the wall been absolutely. with you from your perspective yeah absolutely uh so he he took the shrubbery down which is his right. I mean, it, even though you have a buffer zone, that's um, a right of, um, of a resident to Did do that. take the trees down? What, was a, what he said to us was that the trees were taken down because you, were, you didn't grant him access to And that's property. not true. What happened was when he had his workers taking down his shrubberies, there were other shrubs that were on my side as well. So when they were cutting those down, the police department was called, and there's a police report bearing that out and the police officers came on the property and said listen you can't just cut these down until you have a um you know a survey to show that you can't cut his down as opposed to yours and his let me, wait, let bill's me, I office just wanna, was i just yeah, want to clarify one point which is very important surely because it has to do with the work that was done the reason he said that all of the shrubs were removed was because he was not successful in negotiating with you access to your side of the property. Therefore, the only way in which he could do the work on the wall 
was by removing all of the shrubs. Is that not the case? Uh, I would say that that's not the case. I would say he removed the shrubs, and during the removal of the shrubs, when the police came, I was like, get off my property. What are you guys doing on my property as well? He took that. Well, he's apparently informed his attorney of that and everybody else of that, that I then didn't grant them any access. So before he removed anything, did he talk to you at all? That Did he tell you that no, he was going to remove them at all? He spoke with my wife. Yeah, my wife said, you know, John, as you can see from our kitchen, we're directly, those cars are right there in our kitchen. So she said, you know, we'd, we'd prefer to have some sort of barrier here that's, that's always been there, you know? And how did he react to that? Uh, again, that was with my wife. And he just did whatever he was going to do. Him and I don't necessarily speak to each other. So I, I can't really say that him and I have a conversation about anything. It's not... Uh, not that cordial. It's just that the representation is that there was absolutely no way right, to do the work. Right, and that's not true. Actually, the back of the wall that is closest to the garage, I repaired it myself because it had been laying in my backyard for like two years when he wasn't repairing it at all. So I repaired it. And I had contacted the building department first when, they were, when he was cutting down the shrubs. And the building department pointed out, though, that that's within his right, and the only recourse I have is to make sure he doesn't come on my property because it would be a civil matter than okay. anyway him chopping down mine. Okay. So that's the only reason the police were called. When they did eject his workers back onto his other side, he's taken that as they were you know, told to get off my property, which in fact they were when they were cutting down the hedges on both sides. So there are some that are growing back now. Can't really see it in the, in the winter time that's coming. But I, I do want to address that also, this, his thoughtful consideration of the neighbors and the residents and the other owners. I have another thing to give to you, all right? Please. All right, that's the, that's the latest survey of my property, which his garage actually encroaches on over the overhang in the, uh, in the rear with his water and his uh, drainage there of his uh, gutters. So his building, even when he builds with the building department, he goes above and beyond what it is that he's going to do. Now, that again is not a board issue. It's actually a civil issue because he builds, he gives the board, he gives the building department a set of plans. They check, they make sure the plans are okay. He has to build according to those plans. But what happens is if they're over a couple of inches, the whole argument made me get my property surveyed to show that he was in fact over there. So his consideration of other people's property really is not kind of there. Anyway, well, back to the photos that I've given you. Um, I gave you just a snapshot, a couple of months there of uh, what he aesthetically believes he's using this property for, which is the storage of his garbage pails. So <clears throat> I think that as the attorney is really put here in his letter again in his statement of points that uh, he would like to do this so that the driveway would look aesthetically pleasing. That's his aesthetics and um, they've been moved. They cleaned up some of the property actually just before your walkthrough, uh, which was today. So um, I think that um, the only points then that I really need to make is that um, I realize you guys all addressed most of the issues on the, on the fact that it's self-inflicted. I think that I have some knowledge of the boards and the operation of the government here as well. And um, I realized that during the training that the zoning board is also always asked to see if they can provide something for the applicant without having to actually give him the variance. If a widening of his driveway is a concern, he could have certainly moved, as you saw today, closer to his house, a couple of inches or f one foot or 12 inches away. If he needed to uh, be granted such a variance, he wouldn't need the variance, which is one of the uh, government handbook uh, things that they always tell everybody to go look for. I think that from my video, I want you to consider the fact that it's not just sunny days that we're talking about here. We're also talking about a gentleman who the attorney pointed out is 90 years old and owns a three-family property that tomorrow could be a three-family property with 20 cars in that driveway or five cars in that driveway and one in the garage. And I think that that could be another impact onto this, 
onto my property. And um, that's the reason I sent the video. He points out that he's putting in pavers as opposed to blacktop. Both are impervious surfaces. I'm sure he's aware of that and just decided to say that uh, pavers are not impervious. Uh, I guess he thinks they're pervious. They're not. The fact that roots were there beforehand for shrubs is really what takes the drainage away. You can have grass someplace, and that's really not going to be the same thing. What you need is, you know, you have these buffers for a reason. Side yard setbacks are put into law for reasons. Um, I don't think he has any valid reason to ask for this. I think it's a self-made issue. I think uh, the driveway is only falling apart because he did it. I think the work that you saw there, we actually called the building department. They stopped him. How many courses you could ask the building department? Um, maybe three or four, then he was stopped. He added in three or four more at night, in the afternoon, in the day, until you get what we have now. Bill and um, Michael stopped by several times to stop him until eventually they summonsed him, sent him to court, and then he's where we are now. Um, I just have... Um, Really, that's it. I'll leave my, uh, my photos with you of uh, what he has. Oh, the last thing. There's a photograph there of another car. See that other car? Last photograph, right? Yes. That is one of his tenants who now parks on the grass in the backyard. Is, also, that, is that often? Uh, yeah, it's been through. Um, the tenant moved in probably in the fall, and um, yeah, they've, they've been there. I had various photographs of it at different times. I, I really can't. I don't want to look like a psycho out there shooting photographs of other people's cars, but I, I did want to take one for you. That one was just the other day. But that's there on a regular basis? Yeah, I'd say uh, once a week. Um, you know, I was there through the snow, too. And I realized, you know, in the snow, maybe it's hard to park in the snow. I just don't think that we can be, this is not a property that's used the way his attorney is representing that it's used in harmony with the whole rest of uh, the block. and. Um, I can understand Mr. Caparoso's letter. Um, Mr. Caparoso was concerned about a curb cut. He was concerned that the curb cut was also going to be widened up front because I had spoken to Mr. Caparoso. And, um, you know, um, I think that you can see his aesthetics. Uh, it's the storage of garbage cans. You have the photos. Those are now there for the record. And, um, again, this is a three-family rental property. And... There's, there's a big impact. This is not as uh, cut and dry as his attorney would like us to believe. Anyway, thank you. Um, if you have anything you need from me, you can always ask. And the video is from me also. Again, thanks. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. It doesn't look like there's anyone else uh, here. Would you like to uh, say anything else or, um, you know? Well, again, just uh, in response to, uh, I believe it was Mr. Fitzpatrick, uh, some of the statements he made, uh, again, my client, did, and I don't know what the bearing is on whether or not it's a multifamily or whether or not my client resides in the property. Uh, again, what we're looking to do here is a de minimis change. Uh, it's not going to affect or change the character of the neighborhood. Uh, any issues with water, again, I, I, I know there's been some reference to a video uh, I, I have not had the opportunity to view that, so I, I don't exactly know, and I really can't speak to it uh, in, in terms of what that video might show. Um, but again, what I'm going to ask this board to do is obviously grant uh, grant our application. Uh, that is it. Have you seen these Great. photographs, sir? Uh, no, I have not seen the photographs either. Yeah, so we want to enter these photographs into the record, uh, as well as the survey. Bill, do you have, cop Bill, do you have copies of all this? No, I don't. I'll take those. Great. We'll... Um, Forward these to Bill. Uh, I do want to make a couple comments on this uh, before we uh, close the public record. So, uh, what we first of all, we live in a very tight village. We have very small lots. We have houses that are very close to each other. Uh, this is, uh, you know, called a pre-existing condition. Uh, it's been going. It's since the uh, village was started. Uh, and the problem with tight spaces is, uh, you know, people get on each other's nerves, and sometimes people don't see eye to eye on uh, on the way each other is living their life. Um, in this case, uh, what happened is there was a nice buffer between two houses, between two properties of a fairly high, fairly dense uh, shrubbery. And 
it was unilaterally changed uh, to create a chain link fence, which allows, you know, kind of see through. And it sort of removed that, that buffer, that site buffer. And so now we're, we're struggling because we're, you know, what, what happened uh, kind of makes the living situation worse, quite honestly. And, um, you know, it seems to me that if there was a, uh, a solid wall that was put in place between the two sides, everyone could live pretty peacefully or as peacefully as possible. Um, you know, if, if we deny this application and it's just some stones uh, next to the driveway with a chain link fence, I think everyone kind of loses. Um, but we could, we could do that. No one's happy. I don't, I don't think the neighbor, I don't think the neighbor is very happy with that outcome. I think that's a, that's a bad outcome. You don't get the variance you want. Sure. Um, so I, I think what we need to consider is whether there's an alternative. And, you know, oftentimes, as I said earlier, when we grant these variances, they're on certain conditions. And so I think, you know, I'm going to, have to consider that, but that may be a way that we would grant it uh, potentially. Um, and you know, I'll just leave it at that. I I, I don't think I'm prepared to vote on this. Are you guys Not prepared? Really. No. Okay. <laughs> no. So we're um, uh, <laughs> for the third time tonight. We're going. I'm going to make a motion to close the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much for your application, and uh, we will uh, discuss this next month. Yep. We should leave it open. Member Scalzo, if, if right, yeah, we should, yeah, we should leave the public hearing open. It, it might be best in this case to leave the public hearing since Mr. Constantine has not seen the video or the uh, right. pictures. He may want to comment on that next time, so you may want the public's comment on that. Yes. It's it's up to you guys, um, but it I might would, be. The I would agree. Yeah, because though. I would like the opportunity to take a look at the, the the video. Obviously, it seems as if it's has a big bearing or, or an important bearing on what the board is going to eventually do. Fair enough. So I guess we will uh, reopen it or <laughs> strike that last strike, vote. Strike the last I vote. I think with so Mr. Constantine. We didn't vote on it. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't vote, vote on it. On. Okay. So then just withdraw that motion. With right. Mr. Constantine's we'll, approval, we'll continue the, the public hearing to next meeting. Do we have your approval? Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank Appreciate you, it. All right, Village of Tuckahoe, thank you very much for attending the uh, April 8th uh, Zoning Board of Appeals. And uh, we will back be back next month. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Or do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.